Good morning, U-Turn. Uh, I'm glad that you can join me and tune into this uh, video Bible study uh, and looking forward to when we can uh, resume our Bible studies in person. Uh, but until then, we're, we're going to keep on rolling with these videos. Uh, I'm really blessed to have Shamar share his testimony last week. And today we're going to be uh, jumping back into Acts, uh, the book of Acts, which we find in the New Testament. Um, so if you've got a Bible, please grab one. And when you have that, please turn with me to Acts uh, chapter 23. We're going to be going from verse 1. And if you remember last time, uh, we, we finished our time on a cliffhanger. Uh, there has, as we've seen over the last few weeks, uh, Paul was attacked by a Jewish mob. They, they try to they see him in the temple. They attack him. They start beating him, trying to kill him. Uh, and that's when the Roman soldiers, they step in. They rescue Paul. But now the commander, he wants to know what's been going on. He wants to know, hey, what's all this commotion about? And so he decides to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin, um, to give you a bit of context, the Sanhedrin was a, a council. Uh, it was basically the, the Jewish high court of justice. It was made up of 71 men and it was led by the high priest. And this council, uh, they had religious and political power. And amongst the people of this council, generally the, the members uh, kind of belonged to um, two schools of thought. Um, basically, there were those who came from the Jewish school of the Pharisees. And then on the other side, you had the Sadducees. And as I say, the council was made up of these uh, people who came from these two groups, these two religious schools. And the reason why I say that is because it's going to play an important part in the unfolding events. Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had uh, opposing views on many viewpoints. Like they, they differed on some, some big points. You could... Maybe think of it this way. It's a bit like uh, the conservative versus the liberal. It's the white ring versus the left ring. That's kind of the idea that we have here. And as I say, this is going to play an important part in the unfolding text. Um, so uh, let us jump in just before we do. Let me just briefly pray. And then we're going to jump in. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. And we do pray by your Holy Spirit. You will lead us and teach us, Jesus. Amen. So, Acts uh, 23 and verse 1, we read this. Now, Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. So, Paul stands before the religious leaders and he says, Hey, my, my conscience is clear. Look, I've simply been doing my duty to God. Paul has been seeking to live and to please, to live for and to please God. And so he says, look, my conscience is clear. And now we see how the leaders respond. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Ananias uh, was the high priest at the time and was a, a particularly corrupt leader. Uh, and we even see this demonstrated in the text here by his unlawful response to Paul. See, Ananias he was meant to issue justice and to judge fairly, to judge impartially. And instead, he commands those nearby to strike Paul. We don't read of any official charges being brought forward. We don't hear of a proper defense being mounted. No witnesses or testimony given. Just commanding them to strike Paul. And then Paul calls him out on it. Calling him a whitewashed tomb. Now, this metaphor uh, is, is similar to ones which Jesus himself used. 
And it's a metaphor which represents hypocrisy. The idea of being a whitewashed wall is like on the, on the outside, they were clean, but on the inside, they were, they were dirty. They were, their hearts were far from God. You see, to be a, a hypocrite uh, it, it is, to, is to wear a mask. In ancient times, in plays, uh, actors would often play multiple characters. And, and, and in doing so, basically, they would uh, bring up a different mask depending on what character they were playing. And that's what it really means to be a hypocrite. It means to put on a mask. It means to play a part. And Jesus, on many occasions, accused the religious leaders of hypocrisy. On one occasion, uh, he says this. This is found in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. This is Jesus speaking. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they were guilty of, yeah, they were saying things with their, they were saying the right stuff with their mouth, their actions were doing the right things, but inside, their hearts were far from God. On the outside, they looked like they had it all together, but inside, they were far from God. They were playing a part. And so often, it's easy for us to maybe see the hypocrisy in others, but how easy is it for us to see the hypocrisy in ourselves at times? Are you guilty of putting on a mask? Are you guilty of trying to play a part, of trying to fool people? Well, the truth is you cannot fool Jesus. He knows your true nature. And what Jesus does is Jesus calls us to no, no longer put on masks or to play a part. No, Jesus calls us to come into the light to be honest about the true condition and the true nature of our heart and our lives. And when we do that, when we come to Jesus, who, as I say, Jesus knows all about us anyway, when we come to Jesus, not with hypocrisy, but in humble honesty, he's there. And then he's, and he's there and he's willing and able to help us. He's willing and able to forgive us and to change us. And to renew us. So are you guilty of putting on a mask like these religious leaders? We read this in verse 4. Uh, Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realise that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. So Paul, Paul didn't realise that Ananias was the high priest and even though Ananias as the high priest was corrupt and even we'd see here his actions are wrong despite that Paul still wants to address him in a way which is respectful in a way which acknowledges the authority that's been given to him and that's why Paul apologizes right he he quotes from the Old Testament book of Exodus and he reminds us that God commands us not to curse or to speak evil of those in authority over us even when they are corrupt or bad leaders uh, instead uh, the Bible actually tells us we're called to to pray for our leaders and in the case of Paul here, it doesn't mean he shies away from telling the truth or exposing corruption, right? We, we should be doing that. We should hold our leaders to account, you know. Um, but what we do see here is that Paul wants to demonstrate his respect to those in authority over him. And God calls us to do the same. It is to respect those who have been placed in authority over us, And so Paul apologises for how he speaks and, and perhaps um, seeing that things are, are not going well, Paul now decides to take another approach. We read this, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. 
When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees said that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. So Paul, he surveys the room, and seeing that people are from these two opposing schools of thought, Pharisees on one side, Sadducees on the other, he then pits them against each other. You see, the Sadducees did not believe in anything supernatural. No angels, no spirits, and they didn't believe in life after death. They believed, hey, look, you die, and that's it, nothing more. So that's the Sadducees. But on the other side, the Pharisees, they did believe in life after death. And so Paul, knowing this, he throws this out there, and now this fight begins to break out, this division between these two schools of thought, with Paul caught in the middle. Verse 9, there was a great uproar. And some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Once again... We see the Romans jump into action, right? They see this division taking place. Paul's right in the middle. They're fearful for Paul's life yet again. And so they step him and they, they take him back to the barracks. And now I want you to um, imagine for a second how Paul uh, might be feeling at this time. The, the text doesn't specifically tell us how Paul is feeling um, but from what takes place, I think we're given a, a, a clue that he is most likely feeling really discouraged right now. And I think in part that's because his own people have rejected him. Remember, it all began with this angry mob trying to kill him in the temple, and they almost were successful. They were almost, as I say, almost successful in beating him to death. And now. This council, this leaders of the Jews, of the people, and, and they're rejecting Paul. They're divided against Paul. And now he's in custody by the Romans. And he doesn't know what's going to happen next. I think it would be easy to see why Paul in this moment could, could easily be down and disheartened. And Jesus knows this. And Jesus sees all this taking place. And Jesus shows up. Verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Jesus shows up. And speaks. And what I love about this encounter um, is that Jesus didn't just speak to him, but but Jesus also stood next to him. And I think there is something just uh, there's something so simple, so physical, and so powerful about Paul waking up in the middle of the night to see Jesus next to him. I mean, how encouraging that must have been for him. How amazing that must have been for Paul to see his saviour, to see his Lord standing next to him, with him in the middle of this difficulty. And there is something I, I, I want us to, to understand, um, which, which really gives hope uh, for, for every Christian. You can see, because in, in some ways, Jesus appearing next to Paul in some ways is a physical manifestation. Um, so you could say a physical revealing of an ongoing present spiritual reality. And what I mean by that is, you see, Jesus has always been by his side. Even though Paul cannot see it physically with his eyes, you see, Jesus has always been with him. What we see here is not a case of Jesus 
being absent, showing up and then going again. No, in some ways what is taking place is Jesus is allowing to see, Jesus is allowing Paul to get a glimpse into the spiritual reality that Jesus is with him wherever he goes. That Paul, having the Holy Spirit within him, wherever he goes, having God inside of him, Jesus inside of him. See, Jesus is with him wherever he goes. And as Christians, we, we have this same hope that even though we can't physically see Jesus with our eyes, as Christians, we have this hope that Jesus is present with us. And this is true, as I say, for all disciples of Jesus. We see this in a number of different places throughout Scripture. Uh, but one which uh, I'm often encouraged by is what Jesus says in the Great Commission. So Jesus, after dying for our sins on the cross, rising again, appearing to uh, others, and but just before he ascends into heaven, he says this to his disciples right at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus says to his disciples, look, I'm with you always. I'm with you. Paul, take courage because I'm with you. Paul, take courage because I know what lies ahead and I'm in control. You may think this is the end, Paul, but it's not. I'm going to get you to Rome. And as you testify for me here in Jerusalem, you're also going to testify for me in Rome. You see, Jesus comes. He reminds Paul, look, take courage because I'm here. I'm with you. And then Jesus then points Paul to his sovereignty, which is, Paul, I'm in control. And there are many moments in life where we find ourselves downhearted and in need of encouragement. And the Bible speaks of a God who loved us so much that he came to die on a cross and to rise again so that we could be forgiven. So that we could have a relationship with him both now and for all eternity. You see, you too can hear the words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And all you have to do is to put your faith in Jesus like Paul. You see, when we turn away from our sin, when we put our faith in Jesus, he promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He gives us his Holy Spirit, God himself, to live inside of us as our guarantee Wherever we go, he is with us. He will not leave us. He will not forsake us. And he is present even in the most difficult of circumstances and is able to say, as he said to Paul, take courage. So I pray today that if you are a Christian, take courage because Jesus is with you and Jesus has a plan. He is at work. And if you do not know yet, yet know Jesus, I want to invite you to, to put your faith in him. And as I say, hear those words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Um, so let us pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray that today we would take courage. Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged by the fact that Jesus, you saw what was going on in Paul's life. You were with him and I, you knew that he was downhearted and so you came and you encouraged him and I pray for us Jesus you would encourage us and some so so often that, that encouragement can come through through reading the Bible it can come through um, other people you Jesus using other people to speak good things into our into our lives into our hearts God and so Lord I pray for these guys encourage them and encourage me this day that we would take courage Lord and that we'd be reminded of the hope that Jesus, for all those who put their faith in you, you are with us wherever we go. So I pray you would bless these guys this week, Jesus. Amen. I want to thank you uh, for tuning in, guys. Um, as I say, I pray uh, that you would have a blessed week. And, and yeah, um, looking forward to when um, we can uh, do these studies in person. Uh, but yeah, until then, uh, God bless and uh, yeah, take care.